Good morning. If you will, continue to hold your place there at Revelation chapter 2. You know, throughout the Bible, there are a great multitude of names that are provided for Jesus. And throughout all these names, it helps us to better understand who he is, the different aspects of his life, whether it be his uh, living here on this earth in the flesh, uh, even his going to the cross to give his life as a sacrifice his ascension to heaven, his death, burial, resurrection, and then being with the Father again. You think about even in the book of Luke, sometimes used, it is the Son of Man pointing toward Jesus and his humanity. Other verses state Jesus as the Son of God pointing toward his deity. You think about John the Baptist who says, Behold the Lamb of God, recognizing the sacrificial nature of Jesus Christ to give his life to save the world. You think about in the Gospel of John and the I am statement, some eight I am statements made. I am the bread of life. I am uh, the way, the truth, and the life. I am the door. I am the true vine. All these things that are stated to help us better understand who Jesus truly is. You go into the book of Revelation, it's just the same. There are actually some 30 names or phrases that represent who Jesus Christ is found in the book of Revelation. I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, the end, pointing to his eternality. But one of the names was found in the text that just was read for us. In chapter 2, in verse 23, as it states, I am, and he also clarifies, all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and the hearts. Now, when we take that into consideration, as it is Jesus, our Lord and Savior, He's the one who searches our minds. He's the one who searches our hearts. We need to consider a little bit more about the heart. Now, we recognize that when the Bible talks about the heart of man, it's not talking about necessarily the physical pump that's beating and pumping blood throughout our body, but rather the spiritual mind of man and how we use our thoughts, how we use our mind and our knowledge, even as discussed in Bible class, to guide our lives. Now, some might also add to that, saying the emotional side of man. As they use their emotions maybe to guide them through life in statements such as, I love her, I love him with all of my heart, allowing their emotions to drive them. They would represent that to the heart of man just the same. But as it relates even to the heart, what does the Bible say about the heart? You think about Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 and 10. He says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who knows it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the minds, even to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his doing. And sometimes when we take into consideration the heart of man, we don't really think about that side of it. We don't think about what the Scripture says, what the prophet said about the wickedness of the man's heart. We also recognize, even as just stated, that Jesus is the one who's searching it. He is the perfect judge, and he will judge us in the end. And we know that nothing is hidden from the eyes of God. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 13, there is not one creature who is hidden from his sight. And when we think about that, and we think about our own lives, and how I live, and I go outside of these four walls, and the life that I live, what does he see when he examines my heart? What does he see when he examines my mind. As we go through this text, or as we cover this specific name, I want us to consider three questions. I want us to consider how, I want us to consider what, and I want us to consider why. The how is even found in a statement provided in verse 18 of this very same text. Revelation chapter 2 and verse 18, it says, And the angel of the church of Thyatira write these things, the Son of God, another statement made, a name of his representing his deity, says, He who has eyes like a flame of fire and feet like fine brass. What does fire do to things? Fire consumes things. It gets all the way down to the core of things. It says his eyes are like fire. His eyes burn through to the core, and they see you for who you truly are. And his feet are like fine brass. They're firm. They're sturdy. They're not moving. His judgment will remain steadfast all the way to the end. You see, he knows the innermost intent and desires of your heart. 
and we are completely transparent and vulnerable before his searching eyes. Now you take into consideration even the things that are written in, the first, in chapter 2 and chapter 3 of Revelation. If you're familiar with the text, you know that he goes through and he examines congregationally. His searching eyes are examining each one of the seven churches represented in Asia. Smyrna, he says, look, you're materially poor. Yes, you're materially poor, yet you have this great wealth in your hope. And you need to continue to hold on to your faithfulness. Ephesus had this attitude of self-righteousness. They had presented themselves as a standard rather than turning and looking at Jesus the Christ. Ultimately, he tells them, look, you've left your first love. Pergamos, they had some good things going. But they had turned to the world and they began to practice these same pagan practices and idolatry that the world was doing. They were allowing these things into their worship service and he says, you need to correct this. Thyatira, the one that was just read for us, your works are diminishing. You are becoming corrupt from the inside out. Sardis, you have a name about yourself. He says, look, yes, you have a name. You have a reputation of being somebody, but I know you. I know your works and you are dead. And maybe the one that we're most familiar with, Laodicea. You see, they thought that they had everything figured out. Laodicea thought that they were completely and sufficient in everything, yet the Lord says you are lacking everything. He says, you're neither warm, you're neither cold, you're neither hot, you're lukewarm. I will spew you out of my mouth. And what we recognize is though he searches congregationally, what was it going to take for each one of these congregations to make the changes in the congregation? When somebody speaks about making this world a better place, where does it start? Myself. You hear statements like one act of random kindness to change the world. That begins with me. Just the same as Jesus is examining these congregations and he's telling them, look, you might think that you're doing everything right. And how many congregations feel as if they are laboring abundantly, they're doing every single thing right, just like these probably did. And he says, my searching eyes expose you for what you truly are. He says, these are the things that you need to work on. And the expectation was individual change. Each individual of the congregation was going to make the proper changes in their life to be pleasing unto the Lord. He sees us through and through for exactly what we are. He sees through a facade. It's merely surface level deep. He sees through any charade. He sees through hypocritical behavior. The description given to the Pharisees in Matthew chapter 23 and verse 27, you whitewashed tombs. Yes, you're beautiful outwardly, but you're full of dead men's bones. Hidden sin, he sees it. Impure motives, he knows it. He knows the secret things of the heart, Psalm 44 and verse 21. You see, we may fool our brethren, we may fool the people in this world. We might even fool ourselves. But we're not going to fool the searching eyes of our Lord and Savior who says all the churches will know that I am He who searches the minds and the hearts. You see, oftentimes when we think about Jesus and His searching eyes, we remember, yes, He sees me. He sees what I do. We know that nothing is hidden, just like verses Luke 8 and verse 17. Nothing hidden that he will not see. Nothing that will not be brought into the light. But it goes beyond our actions. It goes beyond the way that I conduct myself at the workplace. It goes beyond how I communicate with other people in this world. It goes all the way down to the intent and motive of my actions. He knows the motive of our heart. He knows the intent of our heart. Am I doing things to be seen by men? Does it have to give me some sort of better standing in society for me to actually take on some sort of work? Am I doing things only for my own selfish gain? Do I look at a situation and say, well, what's that going to benefit me? 
Or do I look at a situation and say, how can I help this brother in need? Am I doing things out of spite? Merely going through the motion saying, okay, I guess I have to do this because somebody sees me and I have to make sure that I represent what Christ is supposed to be or what he is. Or am I truly doing it because I love the Lord? You see, sometimes we think we're doing everything as we should, but with thorough investigation, we might reveal some things about ourselves that might be a little bit displeasing. Proverbs 16 and verse 2 says, All the ways of man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirits. You see, it truly is a heavy matter when we consider the searching eyes of the Lord. Now, I'm going to try and lighten this a little bit, and then we're going to come back to the severity of it after this, but you take into consideration, and all the young ones in here, I'm fixing to give you some really good advice. You ready? I learned this when I was young, too. Moms have a built-in superpower. Y'all just be aware of this, okay? You see, when I was a kid, there were times when my mom might have said, don't you do that. Don't you dare touch that. And at some point, my curiosity might have got the better of me. Whether it was the same day, whether it was three days later. She was on the other end of the house. I'm on this end of the house. I have it in my reach. And I would hear, Jared Keith? She can't even see me. It's like x-ray vision seeing through the walls, right? You ever walk into a room and your mom say, what have you been doing? I can see the guilt in your eyes. What, what have you just done, right? They can read you. And this is most effective probably between the ages of about 5 and 12. And it's highly effective. Here's what's crazy. It goes further than this. Moms have it, right? My mom had it. She could read me. Brandy has it. She could read our kids. But do you know she can read me the same way? Seriously. I kid you not, I was in the back of the house and I was studying the other night. And she's in the kitchen. She's making homemade cookies. And they smell great. I happened to come through the kitchen. She happened not to be in the kitchen. I didn't plan it that way. It just happened. I'm going through the kitchen, and the cookies are on the forbidden area on the cooling rack. When they're on there, you're not supposed to touch them. You wait till they go to the container. I'm walking through the kitchen. Curiosity. I see the cookies. I go to pick this cookie up, and it's so warm and soft, it folds like a taco. And I slide my other hand under it, and I take a bite, and she says, from our bedroom, Jared Hammond, what are you doing? I, like, hide the cookie, and I'm like, mm -hmm. She comes into the kitchen, and I'm trying to wipe the chocolate off my lips, and she said, what are you eating? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and like I said, you know, this is most effective probably with moms between the age for the kids as far as between their age of about 5 and 12. And even at that, when it's most effective, it's probably about 70-30 on a good day, 60-40 on a normal day. But you see, there's still times when that mom's going to have to ask the kid, what did you do? Why did you do that? And it's that 30 or 40% of the time where they're completely reliant on the child to be open and honest with them in hopes that they can tell them, why did you do this? What drove you? What was your motivation? Or what did you even do? Now let's go back to the weighty matters. With Jesus, it's 100% of the time, 100% accuracy. Accuracy. He knows our hearts. He searches our hearts and he searches our minds. And you know, we think about this as it relates even just to our everyday life and how, again, as I, I conduct myself at work or, or uh, in the grocery store, or how I interact with other people. But see, there's many sides to this. There's so many layers to this. You know, he knows if we truly repent. You know, I can, I can put on this, this facade and I can fool some people. But he knows. Yes, there are signs that come with true repentance. A person should be truly appalled by their sin. A person should want to make amends to make things right. Luke chapter 19, Zacchaeus. 
He says, look, I'll pay back fourfold to anybody that I might have caused any harm. I want to make this right. And that's the attitude. They accept the consequence and they feel the pain that it might have caused anybody else. You know, we can go through all those motions and our heart still be more about, I'm just doing it because my brethren want me to do it. He sees it. He knows it. Now there's another side to that coin. When someone comes forward and they're trying to ask for our forgiveness and they want to repent of sin and we sit back and we maybe say, yes, I forgive you, yet in our heart we're sitting there thinking, well, how long will it be before they do it again? He searches our minds and He searches our hearts. He knows our intent. We will not fool Him. And the more that we accept the reality of our vulnerability before the searching eyes of our Lord, the more mindful we will be of our actions as well as our motives. That answers the how. Now let's answer the what. What is it that he is actually looking for? In Revelation chapter 3, at the beginning of the chapter in about verse 4, Revelation 3 in the beginning starts off to the congregation of Sardis. Now, Sardis had a reputation, even as stated earlier, of being somebody. Everything that they were, they were seeing about this place and everything that everybody believed about them was built on that which somebody else established. They had this reputation. And Jesus says, I know your works, you're dead. But he also says, there are a few among you who have not defiled their garments. Yes, he recognized all the faults. He recognized all the wrong, but he did see the few that had defiled or had not defiled their garments. You see, he is looking for someone with a good and pure heart. That's what he's searching for. And the more concerned we are about being known by him, the less concerned we will be about trying to hide from him. That's what he's looking for. Somebody who wants to be known by Him. You see, it's having a mindset that I want God to search my heart. It's having a mindset where I say, Lord, please search my heart. Know me because I'm concerned about purity, because I'm concerned about being pleasing in your sight. Turn over to Psalm chapter 139. Psalm chapter 139. And again, think about this in your own life, in your own prayer life even. When's the last time that you had what we're fixing to read? Listen to the words and think about the last time you had this type of attitude or speaking to God. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me into the way everlasting. Do you hear the psalmist pleading with God? Know me. Search me. I want to be known by you. It's a desire to have God know you. It's a desire to be pleasing unto Him. Psalm 19 and verse 14. Let the words of my mouth and my meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. I want to be known by you, God because I'm concerned about purity. I want to be pleasing to you because I'm concerned about keeping your word and pleasing you in everything that I do. That's the type of attitude that we are to have. That's what he's looking for. That's the what. He's looking for the pure hearts. And when we have that type of heart, it's because we have allowed the word to take its proper effect on us. We've allowed the word to transform us into that which is pleasing unto God rather than being conformed to the world, Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. But you see, it's more than just about obtaining that heart at some point in our lives. It's more than just about having this mindset, I want you to search me, O Lord. It's keeping that mindset throughout life. Holding on to it with all diligence. You think about Solomon. He was in a position of a he was the, the next man in line after David and he had what started out to be a great run. In 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 3 he allowed the women of this world to pull him away as he married many women 
and he allowed their pagan practices to come into their worship ultimately winding up with a divided kingdom and all kinds of problems to follow because he was not concerned even as Proverbs chapter 4 and verse 23 says keep your heart with all diligence for out of it spring the issues of life it's a lifelong process yes you obtain that type of mindset and you hold on to it with everything that you have and you do it for your lifetime Psalm 51 and verse 10. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Create in me a clean heart and a steadfast spirit. That's the mindset. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. The end of the instruction that was provided for the congregation of Laodicea. A statement is made that Jesus was standing outside the door. They had removed him so much from their worship that he was standing outside the door. He's knocking at the door. He's wanting someone to let him in. And he says, he who opens the door, I want to dine with you. Who's going to let him in? We listened to a lesson at Focal Point from Mike Vestal. He preached on Laodicea, and there was a young girl, a child in the audience, hearing him preach about Laodicea and Jesus being outside the door, wanting in, waiting for anyone to open the door. And she looks up at her mom, and she says, Mommy, we got to open the door. Pure heart. Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 8. The Lord is concerned about the purity of your heart. We need to be just as concerned. Let's answer the why. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 18 provides a statement to help us understand the why. Another I am statement explaining Jesus the Christ. It says, I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. I am the one who came in the flesh, who gave his life as a sacrifice, who, yes, died on the cross and was resurrected after being buried on the third day and ascended back to the Father. Now look what he says after that. He says, and I have the keys of Hades and death. I have control over death in Hades. The why is that he will judge us in the end by what he finds within our hearts. The question you need to ask is which door will he open for you? I am the one who searches the minds and the hearts and it will be revealed at judgment. And the more, and I think I've said this before, but the more that we appreciate the universal reach of the judgment, the better off we will be. We've heard it stated there will be no more unbelievers in the end. Yes, they may say, I don't know him, I don't care to know him, I don't want to know him in this day. But in that day, they will fall in terror and they will know that he is Lord. Those who have spent a lifetime rejecting the Lord will tremble in fear and they will know that he is the Lord Almighty. But those who have put their trust in him, they will have confidence in the end. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 17. None will escape in that last day. None will be exempt in that last day. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 10, we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Every secret thing will be revealed. Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 14. God will bring every work into judgment, good or bad, every secret thing. And if we had half the mindset about that judgment as we do some of the things on this earth, these worldly things. You think about when you're a child. And mama said, you wait till your daddy gets home. I'm talking about strike fear in your heart. Did mine. I hated hearing those words. You wait till your daddy gets home. And the rest of the day, you're doing everything within your power to try and make up for whatever you did. But guess what? Judgment's coming. And we're terrified. 
And then sometimes when we consider the universal judgment, it's like, oh, that's off in the distance. That's on out of ways. It's not all that important just yet. Life is but a vapor. We will be judged rightly and we will be judged justly by the Lord. We will get what we rightly deserve. Our God shows no partiality. Romans chapter 2 and verse 11. The faithful will receive eternal life and the unrighteous will receive indignation and wrath. Romans chapter 2 verses 7 and 8. And because of His justness, because of His holiness, He cannot but execute judgment to perfection. You think about the attributes of God, His characteristics, who He truly is, what makes up His holiness. He is the absolute fullest of love. He is the absolute fullest and most that one could be of goodness and kindness, but also justness. That means He cannot but execute perfect judgment. We will receive what we rightly deserve. And there is nothing that should be more important to us in this life than that. We have discussed several names even throughout this lesson that represent Jesus the Christ and who He is. Let's flip the script a little bit. What names would come to His mind when He searches your heart? Faithful? Laboring servant? Fearful worshiper, pleasing, loving, caring, wicked, sinful, lazy. He searches our hearts for who we truly are and we'll be judged for it in the end. Hopefully we desire and strive each and every day of our lives to hear, well done. What's the name? Good and faithful servant. When you examine yourself and you examine your heart, what would he say? If the first thing that comes to mind are things that are not very pleasing, what changes do you need to make to hear better things? Each one of us has to answer that for ourselves. And we will give an answer in the end. Where do you stand in your relationship with the one who searches the minds and the hearts of man? If Jesus is standing outside the door in your life, he's knocking. And he wants you to open the door so that he can dine with you. Open the door. Take that opportunity today. But know this. When we live our lives in a manner that is displeasing to Him, we turn, we reject Him, we walk away from Him. He's not going to come running and chase you down. You have to be willing to turn back to Him. If there's anything that we can help you with today as it relates to your relationship with your Lord and Savior, even if it means putting on Christ in baptism, to begin your walk as a Christian. We can study with you about that. Please, let it be known together now as we stand and as we sing.